Uh, let me pray and we'll get started. Father, we're thankful for this morning that you've given us with new mercies. You've held all things together for yet another day. You've encouraged us in the gospel with truth that you've revealed to us about yourself, about our condition, and about the miraculous rescue that you ordained that Jesus would, would save sinners who were condemned rightly. Lord, in all of this, we wish to give you glory. Lord, would you give me clarity this morning? Would you tether my, my words to truth that you wish for us to grow in from what you've revealed in Scripture and the implications for our church? Encourage us this morning and help me uh, encourage these people, these dear friends. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we get to talk about why we sing, and I'd like to just clarify when we summarize things like this, there's a lot behind it, obviously, there's a lot of thought. So you can think of this as why um, people sing. <laughs> that's, that's too general. Um, but you could say why Christians sing, and that's exactly what we're going to lean into. And I hope to even lean in further, which is why GBC sings. Why do we sing when we come here? You know, when I was uh, in college, I remember I was going to a, a, a class and I was in this computer science class. It was discrete mathematics and it had all this, you know, logical stuff. And this guy stopped me, says, hey, hey, did I see you on campus marching across the green space area last night? I was like, yeah, I, I was actually there. Uh, you must have recognized me, you know. Why? Why do you ask? He goes, were you going to like a religious group, like a Christian thing? I was like, well, yes, I was. Yes, I was. That's exactly what I'm thinking. Gospel opportunities. This is great. The Lord just teed me up. I said, why, why, do, you, uh, why do you ask, by the way? He goes, because you were carrying a guitar. Like, what other goofy group would like get together on campus and sing? But you bring guitars where you go. I don't know any other groups that do that. And as I opened my mouth to retort, I realized you are absolutely right. Uh, that is weird. And I don't know any other groups that do that. Um, and I did, I did get a chance to tell them. It was, a, it was a navigators group, and we were doing discipleship stuff. And it was a prayer night, and I got to lead music. It was great. But he, he really didn't want to talk about that. Um, but it is a little weird. And throughout all of history, God's people have sung together. Singing is throughout all the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament. Um, we do it together today. And have you ever wondered... Why we do that, given that it's, it's not normal for people to congregate and, and sing. Um, it's not just because it's a fun group activity. It's not because someone started it long ago and it's been a great tradition that we've held. Um, it's worth asking, wh where did this come from? That God's people sing songs with great purpose, with deep conviction in every season of life that they've walked in since the beginning of God's people. The short answer, I'm going to give you the short answer, and then we're going to work it out together and, and just work it out in our environment. Um, the short answer is this, because God has instructed us to. But then the second question is really great. Why would God instruct us to? That answer is because God has imbued singing with great ministry purpose for the church. So this morning, I'd like to encourage you in what God's word reveals about his purposes for our singing um, and how that drives our singing here at GBC, and how this should compel us to participate uh, wholly. We're going to do this by looking at four important ministries of corporate singing. Four important ministries of corporate singing. And I've shortened that title too for simplicity. <laughs> Here's how I want you to, to, to read this though. These four important ministries are not just ministries that you get ministered to or that the church gets ministered to, you know, by. Uh, these are actually four ministries that every Christian is called to. You're called to it. Um, and that's important because I think with my role as director of music here, you may think I'm saying this because I just want you to know that the church has these ministries. Uh, that's different. It puts us in the driver's seat. Uh, these are not my ministries as in my role. These are ministries that every Christian is called to do. And it's my role in the church to lead in such a way that enables the church and every individual to participate in these ministries well. And uh, I, that's a privilege to make that my role. Open your Bibles to Psalm 96. 
Um, here we're going to find an example, a prime example of Scripture instructing us to participate in our first ministry of corporate singing. As you turn there, I'll just say ministry number one is the ministry of singing in worship to God to exalt and commune with him. This is the ministry of singing and worship to God to exalt and commune with him. Let's read Psalm 96 together. Uh, I'll read out loud. You can follow along in your Bible. It says, Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. Tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord gl the glory of his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy attire. Tremble before him, all the earth. Say, among the nations, the Lord reigns. Indeed, the world is firmly established. It will not be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad. Let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all it contains. Let the field exult in all that is in it. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Therefore, before, before the Lord, for he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth and he will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. In this psalm, God's people are given specific instructions to worship. If you were paying attention, there were commands to worship and there were things to worship about. There's actually commands to sing. Look at verse one and two. Uh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord blesses it. That's a command. Those are imperatives. And then if you keep reading, we learn what it is are we supposed to be singing about? And there's actually instruction there too. Um, verses two and three, we're to bless his name with our singing, proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day, to tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among the peoples. Verse seven and eight, we're to ascribe glory and strength to his name. These are the contents of the psalm, contents of our words as we worship. So not only are God's people to sing, according to this psalm, and there are many like it, by the way, but this is exactly what they're to sing about. Sing about the greatness of God. Extol his name. Sing of his salvation, his glory, his character. Sing about his amazing attributes, his works. What's a takeaway here? You know the contents of our songs matters to God? This is demonstrated throughout Scripture, and, and I, I just want you to know it. Um, it's for this reason that we're selective about the songs that we sing here at GBC. The first and foremost important factor in deciding whether we sing a song corporately is truth content. It is the question of does this song sing and express biblical truth that accords with scripture, with God's word, and does the song draw attention to the types of truths that we're instructed to? If not, then we don't continue even considering the song, no matter how beautiful it may sound or other qualities that it may have. Uh, but the contents of our songs matter. And by the way, there are a lot of great worship songs that we do pass on, and I know that. Some people have asked about a few. Um, sometimes they're just not clear in what theology they're really singing, or sometimes they're unbiblical. Or sometimes they just draw attention way too much to self. That's a big trend these days. It's all about me, you know. God's faithful, he's good, but it's, it's all for my good. And look, there's scripture that talks about that, but when we gather and we see the example set for a lot of, of passages that say sing, it's about drawing all our attention to the glory of God. So this first ministry is not just the director's ministry, it's, it's your ministry, um, and, and I, I wanna help. 
by choosing songs. We want to help by putting songs in front of you, teaching you songs that help you to exalt him and commune with him. I have several other um, passages up there that we're not going to go through. We're just going to look at Psalm 96 for the moment before we move on. But if we keep going, how, do we, how are we to worship him? There's even instruction on how we are to do that. Verse 9 and 10, it mentions this. It says, in holy attire, um, to tremble before him, testifying among the nations of God's sovereignty. Uh, we could talk about the cultural elements of that. But in short, we're to be reverent in such a way that even testifies to the world um, testifies of his greatness and worthiness because we're extolling his name. We're lifting his name. So this is the first and foremost, this is the most prominent uh, ministry of singing that we're looking at, singing in worship to God and about God in worship to exalt him and commune with him. There's just a lot of examples, particularly in the Psalms, but throughout all of history um, and in God's word. So if you're a Christian, you are called to this ministry, and I want you to be encouraged by that. Ministry number two, Singing in ministry to each other. I want you to turn to Colossians 3.16. Paul is in the middle of a lot of practical, wonderful stuff. It's one of my favorite chapters, Colossians 3, so practical, affected me all the way back in high school. And to this day, I, I still grow in the fundamentals here. But right in the middle of this, where he's giving all these lets, let this happen, let this happen. He says this in verse 16, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Here we see uh, another unique ministry of singing together when we get together corporately. I know that sounds business-wise, but it's an actual appropriate term. When we gather, that's a special kind of thing. The things that we do when we gather corporately are a kind of worship that is a privilege that not all Christians actually have if they're not in a church like ours. And so we're benefiting from these corporate elements. So while we are doing the first ministry that we looked at, singing of God's gratefulness, or his greatness, his, his salvation, extolling him in worship. We also have an active and important ministry to each other as we sing. And the command here is to let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. And when we're obedient to this, the word of Christ, when the word of Christ richly dwells in us, Specifically, the realities of the gospel, um, his salvation, and more broadly, all of God's truth. When that is dwelling in us, there's a ministry that is to flow from us. We teach and admonish each other with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That's what this says. Singing, and as we're doing that, we're doing that with thankfulness in our heart to God. When we sing to God in thankfulness of what is true, our singing is a potent ministry of God's word to each other in the church. Did you know that? Put another way, there's something about people who are transformed by the grace of God and the gospel, the word of Christ. There's something about people who've been transformed by the gospel. We grow in understanding and wisdom of what a daily life is like in Christ, recognizing the realities of his truth and the glories of his salvation. And then we overflow with thankfulness in our hearts to God, bringing a natural disposition to want to encourage each other with it. And an important way to do this is in the songs that we sing when we're together. The songs we sing are to be full of the rich truths of wisdom that cause us to overflow in thankfulness to God. And in doing this together, we teach and admonish each other with spiritual truth that we need to hear and we need to hear often, don't we? So Paul writes this ministry to the Ephesians 2. He says a similar thing. You don't have to turn here, but Ephesians 5, 18 through 20. Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. So Paul 
actually taught this in the churches. This wasn't a one-time thing for the Colossians. It was part of the ministry that he wanted to train people to do as the word, as the gospel transformed them and they were overwhelmed, overflowing with this truth, it would come out in this ways and they wanted to exercise that when they gathered as a church by singing. And, and I, I, I give it, yeah, maybe this is personal too, but I, I don't know. I don't always walk up to someone and encourage them by singing a song to them. That sounds... So I'm assuming this is very corporate. And that's what he says when we gather. So uh, this is a ministry all Christians are called to in the church. If you're a Christian, you're called to this ministry of truth to one another. When you sing with the church, you are actively engaging in ministry, spiritually teaching and encouraging and admonishing the church when you sing. And it's an incredibly valuable ministry. The person that you're sitting next to, to the church at large, that's the part you play. I just want you to be aware of that and be encouraged by that. So what's the takeaway on that? We'll participate. We need it. Don't withhold the ministry that you've been given because you have the gospel. You have grace. You have truth. Friends, can I encourage you? This is a ministry to me. In those seasons of life that are hard, difficult transition seasons or difficult trials, um, or, or maybe when I'm struggling spiritually, I need to hear the conviction of the church on this matter regularly. It ministers to me. I benefit from hearing the saints all together proclaiming in one voice that God is good, God is sovereign, God's about God's loving kindness and how it never fails, that God's mercy is greater than my sin, that God is near to the brokenhearted, that he is your stronghold. I need to hear that. That he's glorious and he's trustworthy, that his salvation is full of mercy and goodness, that all the words of our language couldn't fully express, but I hear you singing them with great encouragement, great conviction from your own heart, your own soul that's been transformed and affected, brought alive by these truths. I need to hear that. And it is a blessing to me. Actually, I... Some of y'all don't know this, but I get the best seat because I get to hear every voice pointing at me. If you're sitting halfway back, you're only hearing the people behind you. You know that, right? I get to hear everyone, even even our friends in the front row. And they're all, it's, it's just an amazing ministry. It really is. So participate. Sing in solidarity with one another. Remind us when we forget. Convince us when our faith is flagging. Let us hear you rejoice in the gladness of your salvation when some of us may be struggling to have joy. Remind us of our need for a Savior by singing of your heart about your need for your Savior, your hope in his glorious gospel, about your God, his character, about your stronghold that never fails. So participate. Don't withhold this ministry that's so powerful and meant to have an effect on the church. Ministry three. Singing in ministry to one's own soul. The third ministry that scripture testifies of is using song corporately to sing to to yourself. (laughs) There are a great number of passages that exemplify this ministry. Go ahead and turn to Psalm 103, one of my favorites. My grandfather used to quote this all the time, and it was just something that we quoted to quote our grandfather because of the way he said it. Bless the Lord, O my soul. But in these days, what a sweet ministry. And I can think back to his just 95 years, 90, how many years of faithfulness um, singing this and telling us this. While you're making your way to Psalm 103, actually, let me use Psalm 42 as another example, just as an opening. You don't need to turn there, so just I'll meet you at Psalm 103. But as I look at Psalm 42, look the inscription of this psalm, which is, by the way, is the first line in the Hebrew. It's, It's actually in there is written, it says, written for the choir director. I love those. (laughs) To find out a whole passage of scripture was actually written for the choir director to be sung corporately, to be sung to the people over and over. You know, you don't write a song once, canonize it, and then just be done with it. I mean, this is all the time. As I look at Psalm 42, and, and I've noticed that it's a song, 
I notice that in this song, there's a, there's a prayer expressing the people's need for God's protection and help. And we need to notice who the lyrics are written to. This is that's what this ministry is, is demonstrating. And many of the lines of the song, for example, in verse 5 in Psalm 42, it says, Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. So it's just instructive. Who's being addressed in this choir song? The psalmist's own soul and having the people sing it, so it's addressing their own soul. He's singing truth to his own soul, saying, soul, listen up. <laughs> Hope in God. Praise him again for his help. He is near. He helps. Praise him, soul. It's instruction. Not in song, corporately, together. Uh, in Psalm 103, likewise, look in the first several verses now that you're there. This is a Psalm of David, it says, and it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. And the psalm continues, proclaiming God's righteous deeds, his judgments, his faithfulness, his compassion, his loving kindness. This psalm was captured that the, that the people would review it often. It would, they would sing it together. What an example Continuing to do the first ministry of singing that we looked at, extolling God, communing with him for his goodness. <laughs> but within this song that extols God's character and actions, it, there's a clear divinely inspired purpose to minister to one's own soul with the same truth that we praise God for and that we minister to each other with, right? We're not left out. If I'm... It, it should be enough, and it is enough, to know the truth. It should be enough to, to hear other people confess the truth. But sometimes, guys, we gotta, we got to preach to ourselves, don't we? And to do it in song? Ooh, with a bunch of other people confessing the exact same thing. Our soul often needs to hear afresh the rock-solid truths of God that is the foundation of our hope, strength, and steadfastness. That's why these are in Scripture. That's why it's modeled for us to be reminded and encouraged and admonished by God's truth. And we're to apply these truths to our own souls with the songs that we sing when we gather. That's what corporate singing is about, and that's your part in it. You gotta, you gotta preach it to yourself too. You know, there's something special about music. I'm gonna take just a slight aside because, you know, last time I taught this, I only had 30 minutes in student ministries, and uh, I've got another half hour on here. So, um, no, but it is, it is something to, to think about. There is something special about music, something about singing in particular that touches the heart, touches the emotions. Even the, even the secular world knows this to be true about humanity and the arts and, and music in particular. This is why movies have soundtracks, right? I mean, you're watching the movie, and more often than not, it's the soundtrack that tells you the feeling of the scene. And boy, is it effective, right? Right? Uh, you know the intense and scary moments, the heartbreaking moments, the, the victorious moments, the moments of joy and elation, the touching times. It, it, the music makes you feel it. And music has this ability because God designed it for that. Um, and he, he even uses it to bolster and he uses it to let people know what is triumphant. And it, it's just fascinating that we were designed this way. And it's the grace of God to have us employ music to minister to our souls and to each other by marrying lyrics of his glories and his truth with music that expresses these truths deeply in a song. To strengthen our souls with anthems, to comfort our souls with quiet melodies and sweet harmonies, to rejoice our souls in songs of praise so that when we gather and sing together, we are to direct the impact of God's truth in this expression toward our own souls and toward each other in worship to God. This is how all these 
ministries come together. And on those days when we arrive at church and our, and our hearts are heavy, our minds and hearts are distracted, or maybe our hearts are fearful or apathetic, we need to be diligent to stop listening to our hearts. And we must preach it truth, truth to ourselves that we hear preached in the sermon, uh, modeled by those around us and sung around us. The truth is, it, it, it should be preached to us. We need to, we need this. That's right, on those days, let me just say it again, when you show up to church and you don't feel like singing because your heart isn't in it, open your mouth and sing. Let the ministry of the corporate time of singing be something that helps you. I've, I've had people say, I don't feel it, so I better not open my mouth. Guys, that is not what scripture demonstrates here. Sometimes you gotta say, soul, listen up. And the expression of the music should grab you. And the fact that everybody's singing should encourage you. Those are expressed ministries. So I don't, I don't wanna undermine that. I understand that can be abused, that can be manipulated. But sing the truth to your own soul. And when, you, when your soul needs this ministry most, you won't have your, only yourself singing this truth to you. You'll have the solidarity of four to 500 other voices in this room on a main service. <laughs> Praise God. What a blessing. So sing to your own soul the truth in this powerful ministry of corporate singing that we're called to for God's glory and for your own spiritual good. Um, just while we're on the topic, um, this touches on an important area of discernment as well in worship, and it's just even more so with the churches around us and the way that maybe our culture does this. Um, let me just say this. If you are engaging in these ministries well, and if you are taking time to dwell on the truths of the gospel and what we're singing, and this is not new territory for you, you've been through life with this truth, you've applied this truth, you've studied this truth, you've heard it preached to you, you've been growing in it, and you suddenly have this expression in a song, and you've got the swell of music tugging at your soul, and you've got people around you shouting it out, you know what? It's gonna hit your heart. Emotions are gonna get involved, and you might... Feel it, <laughs> well up. Um, I just want to encourage you, it's meant to. If you're cold to these truths, then you've got more work to do. There's an appropriate time and place for emotions and worship, and we don't want to misplace that. But can I just tell you, uh, this is why God gave the commandment to Moses in Deuteronomy 6, 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your might. This is exerting energy, might. Jesus said in Mark 12, 30, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The Psalms over and over. Um, I, I, I will give thanks to the Lord. I will glorify my God with all, God with all my heart, with expressions of joy, rejoicing. <laughs> Scripture even tells us that we need our hearts in this. And so I don't want to be afraid of it, is all I'm trying to say. Um, I get it. A lot of us have seen emotion become the point. It becomes the goal. I'm going to show up, sing these songs so that I can have an experience of feeling. Guys, that's idolatry, actually. We don't, we don't want to do that at all. We don't want emotion-driven worship to use... Um, Todd Murray's words to me. By the way, I've been shaped. All of this stuff, this is stuff that I've just been so blessed to be led by pastors and taught these things and then to ruminate on them and see them in scripture and grow on it for years, which is why after a long career in a business world, man, if I can, if I can finish well leading these things, I'm just, what, a, what an honor. Thank you. <laughs> I'm thankful to be on staff here and to make this a thing we can talk about. But Todd Murray taught on this and TES. My friend Dan Smith shaped me for years in this. Aaron Johnson taught all these ministries to me over and over at Mission Road when I sat under him. And so it's just great that we grow in these. But the shepherding of what we do with our emotions is one of those. To have emotion-filled worship, but not emotion-driven worship, is important. Um, it's easy to fall into the traps of the feelings and the emotions being lifted to why we do this. We do this because he's worthy. God is worthy. 
And even when I don't feel like doing it this morning, he is worthy. Please don't make experience the measure of whether or not your worship this morning was good. (laughs) Because I've been there. And I've had the heartbreaking experience of people in other settings come up and say, wow, when you lead worship, it's a great feeling. (laughs) And so why don't you lead worship more often? And it just broke my heart. Guys, the Lord's glory and his worthiness never changes regardless of my circumstances or how I'm feeling or how apathetic or inconstant I am. He is worthy and his truth is worthy to be sung from the heights. And it's our ministry. It's our ministry, not this ministry up here, but our ministry as a church to open our mouths and sing of that and not start to pick and choose. You know what? I'm going to make this dependent on whether or not I like the style of the song, whether or not I sing. God's worthy is should not be determinative on these human things. So I just want to encourage you. If you're not really feeling it, (laughs) um, open your mouths. Emotions are not the goal of the worship and they're not the measure of the worship. And if you make it the goal of the measure, you no longer worship God as intended, but you've you've made it an idolatry. Um, So I just want to caution us all in our consumeristic thinking, we, we, we love what it does. We love the response that this has sometimes, but we, we shouldn't want to manufacture it. Um, there are whole churches and denominations now built around giving people that experience. There are songs written that are beautiful, and they do, they tug at my heart, but we're not going to do them here because the whole thing is designed to draw an emotional experience and manufacture that even when there isn't a lot of great truth in the song, and sometimes they're unbiblical, um, or they bring attention to self more than God, or all these other things that that we want to be cautious of, and so it's dangerous. It's not what God designed corporate singing for. So just remember, emotions are not the goal. They're not the measure of the worship. And if you make it that, you no longer worship God as he intended, and, and but if you do engage in God's truth, and exalt him for it in the ministries he gave you, your heart will be affected Some days more than others, because we're inconstant. But God intended to impact your heart, your mind, and your soul with his truth and with his grace and with his mercy. So don't need to be afraid of emotions. We don't need to keep them um, hidden, but we do need to keep them in the correct place. And when scripture demonstrates this ministry of corporate singing and how it has in your soul, it's interesting. There's actually a lot of expressions. Um, God, in, in Psalms even, there are times where it says, Because of this truth, clap your hands, burst out in affirmation and joy. (laughs) And there are a lot of other instructions that it gives in different seasons and in festivals and things that aren't appropriate for a Sunday morning because we're to keep order in these things. But I just want to encourage you, um, the Lord wants your heart in it, and he wants us to have an orderly service, which is why we do things the way we do. But don't be afraid of that. Scripture demonstrates the value and importance and ministry of singing truth to your own soul, And so I bring that up in this one because sometimes people think the ministry to your own soul is the, I got the experience and I'm ministering to my soul. It was such a ministry to my soul. You know what is the ministry to your soul? It's the truth, (laughs) which is weightier than the fleeting feeling, which will hold you steadfast longer than when you leave this place. Because that truth that was just like nailed into your your heart, (laughs) preached to you, sung to you, will, will stay with you throughout the week when your heart's doing this. And because of that truth, we begin to grow in our steadfastness. And so when I say in you, you sing, there's a ministry of singing truth to one's own soul. It's that truth. And it will affect your emotions because the Lord wants your heart. And it will become part of that. Ministry number four. Singing in ministry to unbelievers among us and to a watching world. Singing and ministry to unbelievers. We could, or we could say this. We could say this is the ministry of singing and witness to unbelievers. Those among us and those in a watching world. Uh, go back to Psalm 96 for a moment. We, we actually read this. I, I, I kind of skipped over it on purpose uh, so we can hit it now. But the beginning, it starts off Psalm 96, 1 through 3. It says, sing to the Lord a new song. Listen to how this culminates. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Proclaim. 
good tidings of his salvation from day to day, tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among all the peoples. There it is. While we sing to the Lord proclaiming his salvation, our singing has a witness to the nations that our God is glorious, a witness of his glorious deeds. A few verses after that, look at verse 9 and 10. Worship the Lord in a holy attire. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Indeed, the world is firmly established and it will not be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. I know that the, the immediate command to sing isn't right here, but the psalm started with that, and presumably this is still singing. And there are other psalms that actually directly command this in singing, that we sing in such a way that it testifies to a watching and listening world that our God is real, he is who he is, he's awesome, he's sovereign, he's good, and his salvation is amazing, and it is only through him, and that we're confident in him. We're confident in what he's doing and the world being established and it will not move because he said it there until he says not. <laughs> Guys, that confidence is so needed in this world and it sticks out like a sore thumb, particularly in an election year. Those who have confidence that God is doing this and it's not because some person won or didn't win. It's because we're confident in our God and what he's doing among all the people of all the world. So in the New Testament, we've got a, another passage that reminds us of our evangelistic ministry right. Um, the, the thing that we do here in our church of people among us, actually uh, in 1 Corinthians 14, uh, you, can, you can turn there. Um, it's in the middle of, a, of an interesting section. Paul's instructing on how we do our church service, and he puts a priority on something we should pay attention to here. He's talking about tongues and, and other gifts and things like that and how they're being used to distract and they're not really used to edify. And he says this in the middle of verse 24, he says, if all prophesy, and by this he means to, if all are proclaiming the truth and wisdom of God, and an unbeliever walks in, or an unbeliever, an ungifted man, an un, a person who, who's not understanding what's going on, walks in. He is convicted by all. Why? Because they're all proclaiming the truth and wisdom of God. So if, if, if all prophesy and an unbeliever or ungifted man enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed and he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. What is the outcome then, brethren? Listen, when you assemble, everyone, each one has a psalm has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. Paul instructs us to be aware of the ministry that we have to unbelievers among us, even here at our church, where we are to prioritize in our activities proclaiming truth, truth ministry from each other. Each one of you have a psalm. Uh, it's not just the person up here. You have a ministry. In all the things you do, you know, he was talking about when they, you know, people that were standing up and speaking in tongues and doing other things like that. Look, in all the things you do, this is including singing in the corporate time, it's important for us to realize that we're to prioritize proclaiming truth, edifying each other with truth, and knowing that this gives unbelievers an opportunity to hear and respond to the truth that we're convinced of. This includes the priority of singing, truth, teaching truth. And as we sing truth in worship of God, in ministry to each other, preaching it to our own selves because we believe it, this is evangelistic to the non-believers in our midst. Uh, it's not a surprise to us, right? We have many people who come to our church longing to kind of know it or maybe know all about the truth, but they don't know the truth yet. And it's not theirs yet. And what we don't want to do is portray this is just an experience or this is just a moment where we be, we do, we're doing good things, that we come together and do the right things and you're in the right church and therefore you're saved or you're in the right 
sphere of thinking, therefore you're saved. What we want to do is we want to preach truth and see lives changed and genuineness. It's an evangelistic explanation of what these truths do and what they mean in our lives. Do that. And you know what? We do that when we sing. It's an element. Question, how effective do you think this ministry is of singing to unbelievers among us and to a watching world? If we show up on Sunday morning and we just choose not to sing because I don't feel like it, or I sing, but I sing bored, or I sing, but I sing like checked out in a rote fashion. I'm not really thinking about the words. I'm just kind of, hey, I'm here. I stand up. I sit down. I open this. I... Do you think the unbeliever is going, wow, these people really believe this. It's really important to them. Do you think the, the non-believer who's already cynical because they've been in the church and just wondering what this is all about and just, just hasn't sunk in yet. Are they thinking, wow, this is really important stuff. I should pay attention. This is really compelling. Look, I don't want you to f- manufacture anything when you sing. But engage with the music. Engage with what you're singing. And can I just encourage you? You do this well. I, I'm preaching to the choir here. That's not even a pun. You're literally the choir. I'm just directing. Um, you guys do this well. I still remember when we introduced a brand new song that frankly everywhere else I've gone was hard to lead because it's doctrinally rich. It says weird things. And then there's like echoes and, you know, when we did He is Worthy. Y'all engage with that truth that was just preached by Smed. And the response was amazing. It was loud up here. There were expressions of clapping afterwards. Again, we don't want to manufacture those, but when you're affirming truth, and that's what you're affirming with amens, well, then amen. And people around you believe it's real now because you believe it. These people believe that stuff. I mean, the stuff we're going to talk about today, I'm not going to spoil it for you, but demon frogs going out to kings. It's just like... They believe this stuff, and they're singing it with such conviction and hope. Guys, I, I, just, I just want to affirm you. You do this well, and I want to spur you on even more. So remember that this is a ministry that, you, that when you're singing, sing out, be engaged, proclaim and testify that this is true and that you believe it. It's an evangelistic purpose in the people, um, the, the people of God singing these things. And you know what? They, they believe that back then when they were singing. They would sing this from the ramparts, and they knew that there were other people listening going, wow, they believe this. All right, the importance of these ministries have significant implications for us to consider. And I'm going to break it up into two categories. Um, there are implications of just how we at GBC decide to do corporate singing, and I'd like to just bleed on you for a moment um, about the, the philosophy of music ministry here at our church driven by these truths and others, but primarily these truths. We do music the way we do here because we want to enable everybody to do these and participate in these. Because if you don't do it, it's not getting done. It's not the people up here that do this ministry. It's the people out here. We're just trying to hold it together, put it in front of you, and get everybody in one accord so that it is, it is, it is strong and it is real. Um, that is, let me just say that, um, that is one of the immediate implications is that this is not the ministry of music up here. We will call this a music ministry team, but really what we are is we're leading the choir, the worship team to be doing those four ministries in power and in truth, spirit and truth. That's what we're trying to do. That's, that's our whole existence up here. So, by the way, that's really contrary. That is a turn it on end with the whole rest of the world. Some of the things that happen up here look like you're going to a concert. They look like a secular venue where you would go. And I'm nothing against that. I love going to concerts. But I, I got to tell you, um, uh, it's easy to start getting in the trappings of wanting to do music here like we see concerts do, producing it evoking these great, you know, like when you go to a concert, you play lots of money, you want to be in awe. <laughs> so they do. They use lasers. They use loud music. They, they do all sorts of things to make you go, ooh, ah. And it's really, really tempting to try to use those things here. But guys, we have a completely different purpose, don't we? So we don't. We actually steer away from some of those things. I lead music differently. I would sing these songs differently if it were me in a coffee shop. 
and someone's like, look, impress us. We just paid you to be here. You know, I would do it differently. But we don't. And I tell the singers up here, you got to sing differently so that if we do our job right, it draws people in because of the clarity of this, not, be, not the impressiveness. But man, we got to do it with excellence. We got to be clear. We got pre- to prepare. I got to not sing this so flowery that I'm the only one that can sing it. I got to do it in a key and in an arrangement that everybody feels like, I, I could probably do that. But we're not simple. We're not making it boring. How do you do that? <laughs> That's our philosophy of ministry here. We want you to participate because you are the ones doing this, and we want to lead in such a way. That means the people up here have to be a certain type of people. Um, first and foremost, they're not musicians. They have to be worshipers. They have to be kinds of people that, not perfectly, but demonstrably, their life is about worship. It's Romans 12, 1 kind of worship. All of life is in service to God And that's their spiritual service of worship. And this thing that we do of music is just one element that if that's out of kilter with the rest of life, it's not going to work. And guys, we're not perfect up here, but we we want people up here that are lead worshipers so that if you're invited to join into that, you see, boy, I I see Chris singing that. He he means it. I see that in his life. I see Krista up here playing. And wow, she, she loves the Lord not in singing, but in everything, and that's part of it. I mean, that's what we want, right? Not to hold them up in a pedestal, but that changes our philosophy of, of what we do on stage because we want it to facilitate and evoke and invite people to do these four ministries. I mentioned earlier, it changes the songs that we pick. There are certain songs I love to sing, but I'm not going to sing them here corporately. I'm not going to invite you to because it wouldn't be the best for making these four ministry strong in our church to foster that the other thing about the people up here is they do have to be excellent musicians there's a level of proficiency that is only gained over years and years and years and years of work some of them started when they were this big and praise the lord that he gifts some people some less some more with musical ability and then they had the years to just Do it so that when they get up here, they can express it in ways that isn't prose, that we're just reading lyrics, we're expressing it. We talk about that a lot up here. Guys, we've got to express this truth. Otherwise, we should just read it. (laughs) We put it to lyrics, we put it to melody, and it should express something differently this way. And they've got to be musical to do that, and they've been working on their craft. And I'm just thankful that the Lord gifts the church with that kind of gift It isn't just like, you were born with it. Like, they worked years for this. Their parents had to put them through. The parents had to go through instrument training or vocal training. Have you ever heard a violinist learn when they're this big? I mean, that's the parents' perseverance of the saints. Um, Thank you, by the way, parents. Can, Can I encourage you to use these ministries to stir Um, perseverance in those things to give those gifts to the church with your kids or yourself. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself, but this is how we sing at GBC Corporate. I do want that to spur you on, and I would love more violinists and cellists and (laughs) things like that. So, you know, bring them up the old-fashioned way, disciple them uh, at home. But um, how we do music here is, is greatly affected by these ministries. It's the songs we sing, the songs we choose should do this. If we do our job well up here, I tell, the, I tell the group this often, there are people in our church that don't like to sing. Let's love them. There are people in this church that can't sing this song by themselves in the shower or in the car in the morning. Even if they tried, they couldn't. Maybe because they don't know it or maybe because they just believe they can't carry a, a tune. Guys, if we do our job well and we get enough people singing, they will be drawn into it and they will be able to participate in this ministry. Even people that don't want to. Guys, it's not manipulation. We're laying the carpet out. Do the ministry, Christian. And I, I just want to encourage you, if you're one of them that just says, I, I'm not a great singer. Uh, let, me, let me encourage you on how... Um, on how you can sing in a moment. I'm getting ahead of myself again. Can I just mention a few other things? The philosophy of ministry of these drive. It drives our audio team. If you know the people that are back there and how much they love the Lord and the proclamation of truth, (laughs) they are mixing their audio mix 
for this purpose, for these purposes. Um, it's just interesting. The approach that we take on that, uh, you know, if the music is too loud, how will you hear each other sing and witness to each other if the music from the stage is so loud? You'll hear a band, but you won't hear each other. No, we make sure that you hear each other. You'll notice every once in a while, I'll just cut the band and step back from the mic and just let you hear. <laughs> it's my favorite part of the morning. We're going to do that this morning. You got to know it. I've been sitting in this all week. And we're going to do it. By the way, I'm going to, spoiler, it's great as I faithfulness. Can you just start working? Just warm up. Um, we're going to end our service this morning on that. <laughs> um, it affects how they mix. What if the vocals aren't present enough and people don't know the song well? No, you got to hear Acadia when she sings that because they're, she, they got to follow her. And, and then when I pipe up, they got to hear me. They got to hear what words I'm saying so they know where I'm at on the slides. You know what? The visual team, they, they lead for the glory of God so that you can participate in this. And if they don't, they realize it impacts that. They're diligent. The philosophy of ministry for music matters. Um, you personally, understanding these four ministries of corporate singing has implications for us personally. First and foremost, I, I've already said this, participate, uh, raise your voice, sing out. It's not about how good your voice is or whether or not you're, you like singing or you're a, music, uh, a musician. Um, and as I said, you, you already had encouragement to me in this, you do. Secondly, um, can I just say be mindful of these ministries in how you participate? Put these purposes, these biblical purposes for you joining in in the corporate singing, put that up front so that when you sing, you're singing in a way that helps that. And there are two groups of people that I need to speak to right now, frankly, and this is a family moment, okay? There are people who are so self-conscious, conscious of self that they don't open their mouth and they don't sing. And so here's what we do is we encourage each other in these truths and we, we give these ministries to you and say, do them. We want you to open your mouth and sing. Your purpose is not to bring glory to self. Your purpose is not to protect yourself. Your purpose is to do these ministries. Can you just, could you sing? And we encourage them that way. <laughs> There's people on the other side of the spectrum. We have to put these ministries in front of them because it's their tendency. Maybe they love music so much, or maybe they're an excellent musician, or maybe they don't know that they're not a good musician. <laughs> and they open their mouth and they bellow it as loud as they can, or they're doing all these loud flourishes and things that can distract from these ministries. Um, you know, and so what we do is we put these ministries in front of you and say, be zealous for the church to be the choir, and you're a part of it. Be zealous to do these ministries and encouragement, not distraction. And I think sometimes it's possible for us, even well-meaning people, and I apologize. Uh, when I first got here, I, I, I won't name who it was because I know who they are now. They're my friend. But I was sitting in a chair, and the music's playing, and I was just so thankful to the Lord that brought us here. And I closed my eyes, and I'm singing with everything I got. And I realized um, there's a person's head, like right, right here, right? Because... I'm standing in these rows, and they're, they're close together. We, we do need to be aware. Be, don't be distracting. Don't draw attention to self. If your motive is to draw attention to self, you're stealing glory from God. And if your motive is not that, you just be gracious to the people around you to not sing so much louder than everybody else that it draws attention, it distracts from these ministries, or if I'm doing harmonies, or, you know, I'm not going to kick off into a solo somewhere. That's all self-aggrandizing. We don't want to do that. We want to be in one accord with God's people. And the thing that corrals us is to know these purposes, to be encouraged in our purpose in this. Third, have grace for the people around you. Now that I've just warned everybody, it's going to be really easy to be a judge. You know, don't, um, don't judge people around you and how they are participating. Some people have naturally booming voices. <laughs> My best friend back in Kansas City, man, he'd open his mouth and sing and the entire room would hear it. We'd have him over for worship nights and like we, nobody could hear anything. He just has a booming voice. We're sitting in our living room. It was great. Loved his heart. Don't judge. We can encourage them in these ministries, but don't judge. Some people may not be able to sing well, uh, but love that they're next to you. Encourage them to be a participant of these ministries so that our church benefits from them. Um, fourth, personally consider the words 
the truths that we sing together. I already mentioned this, but without understanding these truths well, it's, it's really hard to be convict- convictional <laughs> and to sing these and to, to do well of these. Consider the words and the truths. Sing with purpose. Sing with conviction. And as you're drawn into participating in the ministry of corporate singing, let it spur you to live life worship. Some people think singing is their worship. You ever hear this term? Oh, great worship today. And what they mean is the music. Um, I, I understand what that means. We don't have to correct that necessarily. But everything we do on a Sunday morning, it's called a worship service. The preaching, sitting under God's word is worshipful. Taking communion is worshipful. Praying is worshipful. All of the pieces, giving, is, should be an act of worship. So if, if, if music draws you into these truths, don't let it isolate to this one thing. In fact, Scripture, by the way, talks about people badly in warning. If, if you one who loves to do an act of worship, but your whole life isn't aligned with that, Romans 12, one kind of sacrificial worship, uh, that's actually offensive to God. These acts of worship that met, were meant to be really a special thing with God's people become kind of odious to the Lord because the rest of your life is clearly about you and we've compartmentalized sacred um, to religious <laughs> uh, or, or, uh, or secular. Don't do that. Let, let these expressions become real and leak into life, whole life worship so that this is consistent. And um, Lastly, on just a personal, I already mentioned this, but in light of these ministries and their impact on the church, consider the benefit of the musical gifts that God has given this church and be thankful for them. Um, musical talent and skill, if, if, if you are one of those people that, that have that, I'd love to talk with you. Not because I just am so desperate to get music, musicians up here, but I really believe that it's the variety and the gifts of the church that the Lord gives us that we are to be blessed by. And there's a richness to that. And uh, so if you are a musician, um, come talk with me. And I, don't, I may not know exactly where to use everybody right off the bat. It may take a while, but um, I'm growing. I'm learning. But I'd love to talk with you. And if you do have kids that are taking lessons, be encouraged. That's a blessing to the church someday. Encourage them to use it for the Lord. This is a personal note. Um, God has purposes for music, his glory, and for these ministries that they play. And, and it helps to have people that the Lord has gifted for that and that we find them, put them in their place, and help them ex- use that for the Lord. I hope you're encouraged just today to consider God's purpose for music and singing in our church, for you to know the ministries he's given you when we open our mouths to sing, and just to be encouraged. You know, and if there's anything that I've said, I try to cover a lot. Come talk with me. Ask me questions. What, what did you mean by that? Um, as you can tell, it's scriptural, but I'm just kind of bleeding on you because I love this topic and I love what the Lord does in churches that sing well. And you are a church that sings well. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the ministry purpose that you placed on corporate singing. May we as a church continue to grow in our participation of these ministries as individuals for the health of the corporate gathering. We're thankful that we can gather. We're thankful for how people lift their voices here. And they do it in truth and in recognition of the truth. Lord, would you cause it to grow? Cause that to be modeled and cause it, cause it to be catching for people that come and maybe from different environments and they sing for different reasons. That even just by being a part of this, Lord, Yes, we're going to teach it, but I pray that our model, our example would be catching and they would see your glory and the ministry that comes from that. We ask that you would continue to bear fruit intended by these ministries and that you would help us that are leading lead well so that the church can be healthy in ways that you designed it for. We thank you for this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.